Welcome to another Fabian Society online meeting. Um, we're delighted that uh, tonight's meeting is going to be a conversation with Emily Thornbury, the Shadow Foreign Secretary. Um, just to explain, if you've not done one of these uh, with the Fabians before, um, we're going to have uh, what will in some ways be like a normal speaker meeting, but with a bit of technology thrown in as well. Um, you'll see that there's a question and answer function uh, in the Zoom video conference. And what we'd love you to do is to type in some questions that you'd like to ask Emily um, at any stage during either her remarks or as it occurs to you during the question and answer uh, in a moment. And what we'll do is pick a handful of the questions and if we can make the tech work we'll bring you in to ask the question yourself if there's a problem with the technology we might need to read it out for you but let's hope that doesn't happen um, you can also vote on other people's questions so if you see a question that someone else has asked when you're looking at that question and answer function then you can uh, give it a tick and that will uh, mean that we'll know which are the most popular questions to try and ask Emily. So that's enough of um, an introduction and we're going to start first with a few minutes of um, a discussion with myself and Emily before I start to bring um, all of you in. So um, hi Emily, you're there and you can hear me fine. Hi, uh, yep, Brilliant, I well. oh, lovely, to, lovely to chat Emily. Um, I was just uh, checking, checking out your Wikipedia page and reminded that I mean you became Shadow Foreign Secretary in June 2016, four days after the Brexit referendum. And goodness, that seemed like a lifetime ago in yeah. politics. And since then, we've had Donald Trump elected, Theresa May's rolling crisis of a premiership, <laughs> Brexit on and on and on, two general elections, and you've opposed four foreign secretaries, all of them men, including one Boris Johnson. So we're going to have a lot to talk about tonight. Um, just my first question is, I mean, in that time as Shadow Foreign Secretary, what's the most important lesson that you've learned about Britain's place in the world and our global relationships uh, for now and, you know, thinking long term over the next few decades? Yeah. Listen, thank you for that. And, and thank you very much for the Fabians for having me. Um, I've really been looking forward to this evening. So, um, but let me, let me, yeah, I mean, I've been one of the longest serving um, shadow foreign secretaries and indeed uh, Labour foreign secretaries. Um, and it has been a bumpy four years. Um, and over that time, I think the, the biggest, I think the biggest things that have affected us has been the election of Donald Trump and has been the Brexit vote, but there's been a great deal else happening too. And many, many challenges around the world and I think that what I've seen is the international world order being completely undermined uh, by Donald Trump, but also by a sort of an increase in nationalism and a sort of a selfishness from the in the West um, and the rise of big men. You know, these these uh, these very sort of dominant um, leaders around the world, whether it's Bolsonaro in in Brazil or in Turkey or Egypt, but as I say, the big daddy of them all being Donald Trump. But their idea that their country comes first, second, third, and fourth, and that the idea of working together is not is seems to be increasingly unknown to them, and that they always put the interests of their country first, and not understanding how interconnected we are. And of course, you get a challenge like coronavirus, um, which can only really be solved by international agreement and by the world working together. And the international institutions have been undermined by the way that we have been behaving over the last four years. Um, it seems to me that the United Nations is only ever as strong as the international community wants it to be. And the international community at the moment doesn't seem to be particularly interested in international institutions. The European Union is completely preoccupied with its own internal problems. And as I say, many other countries around the world are just thinking about their own particular interests and undermining the world order. In that, in that kind of vacuum, it seems to me that there is a, a place for Britain 
and a place not to lead the world. I'm not saying we go back to the idea of empire, but I think that there is an approach that the British have and have had that is one which is popular and attractive to many other countries. And what we should have been doing over the last four years is working very closely with those with whom we have similar values and sticking together. And, and the vacuum that is created by the election of Donald Trump and his complete lack of understanding of the importance of internationalism, we could have been with our allies able to step up and take a role in that. And remember, we have a place on the Security Council. We're not there to be decorative. We have an active role. And what we should be doing is not being a Donald Trump mini-me. We should have our own voice. And we should be speaking on behalf of true internationalists and those that want to be able to, for us to be able to face challenges as a world and be able to work multilaterally. Because that's how Britain's always been. You know, we're a small country and the only way in which we get in power and influence is by working with others that have the same sort of opinions as we do in order to make sure that our voice is amplified. And over the last few years, I feel that I have seen our real confidence, not our arrogance, unfortunately, but our real confidence in our place in the world being diminished um, because we are not prepared to, to work with others and to take advantage of opportunities where we should be. We have two jobs, for example, in the Security Council. One is to bring forward a, a peace plan in Yemen, which we singularly failed to do. And the other one is that we, are, we hold the pen at the Security Council when it comes to the Rohingya. And we have done very little in relation to those. So we have manifestly failed in those two objectives um, and have been, of course, consumed by Brexit and changes in, in government and now Corona. A long answer, and I'll have many other. I mean, there's a, there's a lot to get through over four years. Uh, completely. I mean, I mean in a Fabian book you wrote uh, called The Age of Trump, you wrote a chapter and you said a British government needs to be prepared to stick its neck out for the sake of principle. Would you say that we're further from being a government with an ethical foreign policy than ever? Absolutely. I mean, I think that the bottom line now is trade deals. I think as we come out of the European Union, the government sees everything, sees our place in the world entirely through the lens of can we get a trade deal here? But it does seem to me that when we are uncertain, you know, we've always kind of been anchored as, you know, between America on the one hand and Europe on the other, and we've kind of been somewhere in the middle. And we've been leaving the European Union and America has, is behaving in a particularly bizarre way under the current president. And so we lose our anchor and we lose our way. And it seems to me that in those circumstances, what one should do is go back to core principles. And the core principles are adherence to the rule of law, internationalism, working together. Emily, can I ask you um, how you found working with Sorry. Jeremy and Corbyn about, um, you know, on foreign policy issues, because he's obviously so passionate about these issues himself. I'm sure there were some moments where you disagreed on issues behind closed doors. I mean, how did you manage that relationship? I'm just putting my hand up because I think the other, the other guiding principles had to also be peace and human rights. And they were the guiding principles that particularly that Jeremy had. Jeremy obviously has a deep interest in, in, uh, in, in international relations and has always been an internationalist. And so, um, so, but I mean, it's good because, you know, on the whole, we've kind of, we have, as you intimate, you know, seen eye to eye. And although superficially people might think that we might not agree on an issue such as Venezuela, um, actually we do when we sit down and talk about it. Both of us um, believe that, that human rights, no matter which country we're talking about, have to be adhered to. And that if a country steps outside, you know, and starts abusing its citizens, then they, we should be completely clear about it and completely open, hand, open, open you know, we should be even handed about it. And um, Jeremy agrees with that. We've had to kind of sit down and sort the, you know, talk these things through sometimes, but, um, but there have rarely been a time where we haven't, in the end, come to an agreement. And, and what about Jeremy's initial handling of the Salisbury poisoning? Well, you see, I think that what Jeremy said in the chamber, although it wasn't necessarily expressed in the way that I would have expressed it, I don't think that I had a particular problem with. I think that the problem was, the, the briefing by a, by a um, leader's office spokesperson 
um, after the statement, which went way beyond what Jeremy had said in the chamber. And then I had to go out afterwards in the afternoon and try and mop it up. Um, but if the spokesperson had been as disciplined as he should have been, then we wouldn't have ended up in the difficulties that we were. And what do you think of Richard Bergen's proposal for a, a peace pledge and involvement with party members in some of these life and death decisions? Well, I mean, I get where I get where he's coming from, and I've spoken to to him actually about this because I understand his instinct entirely that that before the Labour Party agrees to military action in another country, we should put it back to our members and find out what our members think. I get that. I understand the principle. But as I said to him, you know, I felt that he was very much that that kind of attitude very much comes from his experience, our own experience of the Iraq war. But there are many other forms of military intervention that are more nuanced and more difficult and more sensitive. Um, for example, you know, in Rwanda, you know, if we had decided, as we probably should have done, to intervene in Rwanda, it would have been something that would have needed to be done very quickly um and and i think that you know putting it back to members and going through the whole process of that and explaining why we were doing it and everything else would have meant that there would have been lives lost um there have been another number of other interventions that uh, that clearly you know we have been involved in and my guiding light is this you get involved in military intervention when you're defending yourself obviously and you get a, and you're defending an ally, obviously. Um, but then the difficulty is, is that when you're not actually acting in self-defense or defense of your friends, then when do you get involved in military intervention? And that's been the problem. And, and, and in essence, what we need to do is we need to be able at certain times to be able to intervene, but only when it is the will of the world, not when it's the will of, you know, Donald Trump, who happens to have woken up one morning and decided that he should, you know, bomb a particular area in Syria. And we have Britain and France falling over one another to do, try to be Donald Trump's friend first and say, we'll be involved too. That really isn't the way that one should ever do anything. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is contrary to, you know, to the way that we, have, we ought to be. So, but what, but if you have a situation whereby the whole of the world wants to do something, but one of one of the countries on the Security Council is vetoing it. How do you get around that? And that, I think, is something that responsibility to protect as a doctrine was trying to develop a way of so that we had a legal framework whereby we could intervene in particular circumstances when that sort of thing happened. And obviously, it was only beginning to be developed when the Iraq war happened. And basically, everybody since then has jumped away and just said, we really don't want to get involved in any of this now. But I think that we now need to start thinking about that again, because we do need, hopefully, post-Trump. And when, we, when the wheel turns and when we know that the only way forward for our world is for us to work together, we need to have a legal framework in which we do things. Yeah. I'm going to come back to foreign policy, but I know that uh, there are already questions coming back. But I just want to... Um, turn to Corona. And before I do that, I just want to remind everyone to keep typing in your questions and voting on other people's questions. And also you can use um, social media to uh, get involved in the conversation as well. The hashtag for the event is Fabian Thornbury. Um, but Emily, let me turn to Corona. I mean, first of all, how are things going in, in your constituency in Islington and, you know, your own friends and family? My friends and family are fine. Um, thank you. Um, I think the the impact of the lockdown is pretty severe in terms of the lo local community. We have a lot of people who are self-employed um, who are very worried about what is going to happen next. Um, and, you know, the closing down of their jobs. We have a lot of young people who share flats and one of their flatmates may not be able to make the rent at the moment and it affects the whole the group. So all of these sorts of things happen. And also, of course, I have a very large remand prison in my constituency and I'm really worried about what's going to happen with Pentonville um, if, uh, if coronavirus gets, I mean, it has put into Pentonville, what will happen? And we have the usual stresses in relation to social care and, um, and how we look after the most vulnerable and very little protection for our social care workers. Um, and the last thing we want is for our social care workers to be going house to house, talking to the most vulnerable and actually spreading the disease themselves. Yes. So yeah, 
Um, I was going uh, to ask you a question that um, Linda Cox has also wants to ask you, which is how well do you think the government is handling the coronavirus crisis? If I, if I was to ask you to say what, a score out of 10, what would you give the government? Well, I always get into trouble when I give people scores out of 10, so let me not do that. But let me say it this way. Let me put it this way. I, Laura Koonsberg says, and she keeps saying, I don't mean to criticise the government when I say this, but we're making it up as we go along. Now, and then obviously we are. Obviously, this is completely unprecedented and it's really difficult. Uh, there's no playbook. There's no you know, previous experience to look to. So it is really difficult. There has not been a problem as big as this. Um, and it takes the government, you know, it's really challenging for government that needs to take radical action. Let me preface everything I say by saying that first. However, <laughs> we knew about this disease um, at the beginning of the year. I think there's a question about whether or not the Chinese were reporting it as well as they should and how good the international reporting mechanism actually is. And we will need to look at that again, I think, after this is all passed, because unfortunately, I suspect this won't be the last time that there will be a disease that will grip the whole of the world. And we have to make sure that we're able, we're fit to, to, uh, to fight it a little bit more in a little bit more of coordinated way than we did before. But there were, were, there were alarm bells. And if we didn't hear the alarm from, from, um, from China, then we at least could have heard it from Italy. I think that the government was, was, I mean, why don't we have enough tests? You know, we didn't have enough tests because we didn't buy enough tests. Why didn't we buy enough tests? Why didn't we have enough masks? I think because initially the government was just taking too long to react. And I think that they were quite attracted by this idea of, oh, it's not that serious. It's uh, if we just get enough members of the population to be effect infected by it, then we can have this herd immunity. And that will be the way that we will be able to progress and we won't compromise our economy. And then I think they realized that if the majority of the population was infected by corona, then they began to realize just how, how, how serious coronavirus actually was and how many people get killed. Then they realize that you get a very large number of people dying you know, in a short period of time and that the National Health Service would be overwhelmed. And in that, there would also be a large number of people who just did not need and would not have died in those circumstances if the NHS hadn't been overwhelmed. So it was as if they had been on one horse and then had to jump onto another one. And I think that there was time that was lost as a result. But, and so whilst I, I think it's easy for me in opposition and with hindsight to criticize, I think that it is right for us to tell the truth. And I think the truth is, is that vital weeks probably were lost. Um, and although the government is falling over itself to catch up with itself now, um, we could have been in a better position if we'd acted a bit faster. Yeah. And how do you think the UK can help the whole world emerge from this crisis in as good shape as possible in terms of, you know, health in other countries and democratic values and our relationships around the world? Yeah, well, that's it. Um, I think it's right. I think that we are, we are so preoccupied with, you know, fighting the challenge at home that we are in danger of realising that this disease is going to go around the world in waves. And as it goes around the world, it's likely to change slightly and it'll come back and challenge us again. And so simply, you know, in order for us to look after ourselves, we have to make sure that this virus is, is stopped as effectively as it can be. So just for self-interest, that's right. But also, you know, we may be having it hard, but imagine if you're in a developing country where people are, don't have access to proper water facilities or you know have not been not as healthy as they could be if they'd had access to proper food they are in in great concentrated areas of either refugee camps or frankly some of the large you know cities in developing countries um you know how will we ever stop if coronavirus gets in there how, we won't be able to stop it there won't be any social isolating there will be none of that none of that will make any sense at all it'll just it'll just sweep through and our problem is going to be you know, how do we, how do we, given how preoccupied we have been with ourselves, actually look beyond our country and do something in order to be able to assist other countries? If we don't have enough masks ourselves, imagine how we will get the British public behind being able to spend money on, you know, masks or anything else. I think in the end, we will, of course, need to make sure there's an international effort 
coordinated international effort to find a vaccine. And that has to be, in the end, that would be the answer. But we also must always remember that however hard it is for us, there'll be countries. I've spoken to people. I had a, um, one of these conferences at the beginning of the week with people from a number of countries from around the world. And they were saying to me, well, Emily, you know, in the end, you can lock down your economy um, and get through this. We couldn't possibly lock down our economy. Frankly, we couldn't do it even if we wanted to. But even if we were able to, you know, how many more people would die if our country suddenly had no income at all, you know, compared to the effect of coronavirus? So we are just hunkering down, expecting us to hit us. And we, and we don't, we feel helpless. Yeah. Uh, Turning back to Britain, I mean, how do you think this crisis is going to make the job of the new Labour Party leader? Is their job going to be easier or harder in this context? Well, I think it's going to be difficult because everybody is preoccupied with coronavirus. And so what ought to be a big event, which is the election of a leader, and it is a, a big event, but it ought to be able to be a big media event and it ought to be able to get into people's consciousness oh, look, the Labour Party have a new leader. Oh, look, the Labour Party is, you know, is, 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 is setting off on a particular direction. But th that will be overshadowed, unfortunately, by, by coronavirus. And so I think that is difficult. I think, though, that coronavirus does, it's like it stress tests our public services, our ability to be able to work together. It's, and those public services that have been the victims of austerity over the last 10 years. I think it shows it up. If people are horrified who are now having to apply for, for benefits um, for the first time and realizing that if you apply for universal credit, you don't get any money for five weeks. It doesn't matter how desperate it is. You might get a loan on your future um, universal credit, but you don't get any money you know, immediately. And when I was leading the opposition to universal credit when the government was first introducing it, it was as if people weren't particularly interested. But they, I think a time like this, you realise that actually that's a safety net which is available to everybody. It isn't just there because of, quote, scroungers. It's there as a benefit for all of us and a safety net for all of us, and it has to be fit for purpose. So I think that that's a good example of how coronavirus is exposing what the Conservatives have done to our country over the last 10 years. Let me ask you about the, the Labour leadership contest. Um, on a human level, I mean, how did you feel on the 15th of February when you, it became clear that you weren't going to get on the ballot paper? Well, I think it was pretty clear I wasn't going to get on the ballot paper on the 14th, actually. Um, but I wasn't sure. And I'd, I'd booked a ticket to go up to scotland um in case the in case i got onto the get onto it so i had to get up to the glasgow hustings so i had an overnight ticket to get to the glasgow hustings in a in a sleeper but i you know on the on the 14th when i hadn't got up and i had this ticket so i gave it to a member of my staff and she went up and spent the weekend in glasgow instead but my husband said don't worry darling i've got a couple of tickets as well and he took me to sardinia which was lovely. It was really nice of him. Although it did tend to show that he didn't have a lot of faith in my getting on the ticket. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, so I took off to Sardinia, which was which was great, and um, and uh, you know I wasn't recognised, and we were able to be anonymous and just uh, just spend time, kind of just, just. I was very very tired, you know when you've been using a lot of adrenaline and we'd gone straight from the general election straight into this. I think I'd had Christmas day and boxing day off, but otherwise I had worked flat out for months and months and months. Haven't done anything apart from working and sleeping as far as I can remember. Um, so I think my first reaction was just complete exhaustion. Um, but yeah, I was disappointed, but you know, it's, this is a decision which is up to the party and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and what uh, do you enjoy important. most outstanding? Huh? What did you enjoy most about standing in the contest? I think I what what I really enjoyed and what I've always enjoyed is going up and down the country and talking to party members. Actually, I mean, I really enjoy that, and people are so open-hearted, and you know, and we'll and we'll and we'll just talk. You know, you just need to sit and listen, and there is such a wealth of 
of, of information and wisdom in the party. It's, it's really interesting just to get a chance to kind of sit and, and talk. And, and the regional differences, you'll go to different areas, there'll be completely different preoccupations. Um, no, I mean, I, listen, I love campaigning and I like, basically I wouldn't be in politics otherwise, would I? You know, I like people, I like campaigning and I really like the opportunity to be able to talk to people yeah. and hearing what it is they had to say and getting some fantastic, extraordinary stories, both good and bad from people. Really lovely. Last question for me before I bring in everyone else. Um, is this the best way to select the leader of the Labour Party or when we next do it, should we change the rules again? I think we're unlikely to keep the same rules as we have this time um, and uh, and I have uh, various suggestions and I will um, feed them in privately. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, right, I'm going to open up, I'm going to bring in um, the, uh, we've got f several top ranked questions with um, people, five people having endorsed the question. The first one I'm going to ask, which is nice and short, is from uh, Peter Halsey. Now, the way this works is I need to press a button to bring Peter in and let me see if that's going to work. Are you there, Peter? Can you hear? Me? I think you can talk now. Peter, I think is that he's... Yeah, he's got. Hi, Peter. It's not. I'm going to have to read his question out. My machine is not working. Um, right, Peter's question is, could we have done more to stop the many civilian deaths in Syria? Hmm. I don't think this is a question that has an easy answer. I know that many people feel that we should have been involved in some form of military intervention in Syria. But my view always was that we should, we should never be involved in military intervention unless we can be clear about what we want to achieve and whether we're going to achieve it by that military intervention. And in my view, to intervene in the Syrian conflict was the conflict, conflict was a, a multifaceted um, civil war with many of the countries around the world being in money in or fighting them. And the tragedy of Syria was that it was as if everybody had a dog in the fight. And I didn't see how Britain being involved could actually save lives or could, could stop the, the war. The, the way, the only way in my view, ever to have stopped the war or to stop the killing in Syria was a political solution. And the last thing that Syria ever needed was more bombs and more planes and more killing. But as having a, some form of clear map as to how we were actually, how our military intervention was going to with the, how our, with a political solution, I couldn't be in favour of that. Um, I felt that it was almost as if, you know, we were being put under pressure politically to support one side at one point and then to support another side. There was not, there were not, um, we didn't seem to have clear allies on the ground as to if we were going to be involved in an air campaign, who were the, where were the, where was the fighting force on the ground? Um, we kept being told about moderate Sunnis that were going to come in and be involved but they all seem to be in the wrong place and exactly what the definition of a moderate Sunni was. None of the plans as far as I could see and I paid a lot of attention to this and listened very carefully to the arguments. I didn't feel that Britain could make a positive contribution in Syria that would help save lives and it's been appalling to have to sit and watch it and I understand people wanting to do something but you can't just do something in order to make yourself feel better in the short term. You have to do something that will have a lasting effect that will be positive. Uh, thank you, Emily. I want to bring in uh, Maureen Ike, who's got a question about uh, the COVID crisis. Are you there, Maureen Ike? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Oh, hi there. Hiya. Okay, so my question was that post once all of this is over, do you think those, well, it's two questions really. So the first part is, do you think those world leaders who were elected on a populist um, protectionist mandate will go back to the way they were after this is all over? Or do you think they will go on to support more, be more internationalist, be more cooperative with other countries? And also, do you think that once all of this is over, the way that governments look at healthcare systems will change? So for example, do you think here it will be more focus on funding for the NHS and social care, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah, so after Corona, what's the effect going to be on internationalism? And will leaders who have been elected on very much a sort of nationalistic, never mind about the rest of the world kind of agenda, yeah. will, they, will they change their attitudes? I doubt the earlier, but I, I hope and I think that the wheel will turn. When we, when we knew, I mean, I know, you know, things always go in waves. And I knew at some point the wave was going to turn, you know, the wheel was going to turn. I think that coronavirus will help to push that. Um, and if the world leaders don't change their attitudes, then hopefully the world will change to their world leaders. And that we will end up with a greater internationalism. And we need to learn lessons, you know, we could have, we could have been stopping coronavirus much more quickly if we have worked together, if there have been a proper alarm system, you know, if, if, if countries then knew, if we could then work together in terms of how are we going to get, a, how are we going to get, a, you know, um, a, a, a adequate protection across the world? How will we make sure that we stop people traveling around and carrying the disease? How do we make sure that we have a lockdown, which is fair? You know, all of these different lessons that we needed to learn. How do we get a vaccination? How do we work together in order to make sure that there is a vaccination? That has to come from international cooperation and cannot come from a Brazil first, America first, Egypt first, whatever attitude we need to work together. I think that in, the, in Britain, I think that after this has all happened, I don't think that the government will be able to continue to undermine and underfund the National Health Service or social care. And we as a Labour Party have to make sure that we don't let them get away with it. No more shortcuts, properly funded National Health Service and a properly funded social care service, because this crisis has proved that great though it is, it isn't good enough and it needs, it's been suffering because of underfunding and the social care has been suffering because of no political leadership for a very long time and no proper funding of social care. So yes. Let me uh, bring in a related question from Norman Rimmel. Uh, Norman, can you speak? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? Go can ahead. you hear me? Yes, hello Norman. Oh, hello, Emily. Um, I'd like to focus on Brexit and uh, our future relationship with the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, do you think that the uh, that coronavirus is going to lead to an extension to the transition period beyond the end of this year? And, yes. Uh, secondly, <laughs> related to that, is, is our relation, uh, is the, the, the kind of agreement that we, we actually come to uh, with, with the EU eventually, is this going to be um, very much influenced by what has happened during coronavirus? You know, is it going to be in, in any way different? And do you think even possibly it might lead to us um, reapplying for membership? I think Park reapplying for membership. <laughs> Let's, you know, I don't think that is an issue which is going to come up again for quite a long time. Um, I think what we need to do is make the best of where we are now. And I think, first of all, yes, I think, I think, um, I think we, of course, we need to extend the period of, uh, of negotiation and the interim period, of course we do. And although the government is currently saying that it won't, we've heard this from the Tories before, they say that they won't do something and then they slip into the fact that they actually have. Uh, I can't see common sense dictates, of course we can't have all the negotiations sorted out with all of this going on. Um, so yes, I think the interim period will be extended. And when we come to the other side of coronavirus, obviously the effect on the economy will have been huge. And so I do think that the government 
really cannot afford to be reckless in its in what the eventual relationship with Europe is settled to be. And I think, and I continue to think, and I've always thought that it is in Britain's interest and in the interest of our economy for us to have a close relationship with Europe because most of our trade is with the European Union. And I don't think that we should be cutting off our nose to spy our face, particularly when our economy will be under, it will be so hard for our economy once we get out the other side of coronavirus. And there will be, I imagine, um, all kinds of economic crises that we need to be fighting our way through. And the last thing we need to be doing is to be trying to sail off into the mid-Atlantic somewhere, trying to get trade agreements all over the world when we have half of our trading partners right next door that just need to have a decent agreement. And I've got uh, one more corona-related question for the time being. Uh, this is from uh, Caroline Bunce. Caroline, can you speak? I'll try again. Caroline, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Emily. Uh, how are we able to hold the government to account when Parliament's been shut down? How can we or our elected representatives question the inaccuracies that are happening every single time an MP stands at the podium? Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's hard when they uh, when they are quite as I mean, they just they just don't seem to have any shame as far as I can see. They will just get up and say red is white, white is blue, you know, no matter. They just say it with a straight face and it's absolutely our job to make sure that we, that we talk in a way which is truthful and reliable and interesting and we need to kind of keep at it. Of course we do. It's hard when Parliament's uh, closed. I mean, Parliament would be closed by now anyway, obviously because of, uh, because of the Easter recess. But in a time of crisis like this, we need to continue to hold the government to account. Whilst also, of course, trying to be supportive. <laughs> so that's the challenge. So in my brief, what I've tried to do is I have, I've had more than a thousand people contact me about being stuck abroad and not knowing how to get home. I have been triaging that and sending it in a way which I hope is, is digestible for the Foreign Office in order to help them to make it clear to them who's, you know, who's who and who's where and you know, the work that needs to be done. I've had, I've, I've also been working with Labour MPs. We have a, a WhatsApp group and we have you know, forms that standardise forms that I've been asking Labour MPs to fill in, again, in order to help the Foreign Office to identify who's who and who needs help. So we've been doing all of that behind the scenes. It's also helped me to get an overview as to what is required. And I have been making that case privately to the Foreign Secretary. I had a meeting with the Foreign Office last week in which I made it clear what it was that I thought they needed to do. They needed to have a comprehensive strategy. They needed to make sure that private companies were no, commercial airlines were no longer taking the mickey and charging the sort of fares that they are. Make sure that the airports are kept open. Yes, work in conjunction with commercial airlines, but frankly, where they aren't doing things properly or where we have people caught up country, we, I think we need to get the RAF involved. And I kind of went through all the things which I thought that they, they should do. I pointed out which are the major countries that need to have airlifts if necessary, which is India, Pakistan, uh, New Zealand and Australia. So I've been passing all this information on to them. And then they come up with a, with a, a statement as Dominic Rabb did a couple of days ago, which is just more of the same you know, not actually coming out with any kind of comprehensive plan, completely unhelpful for if you're a, an elderly couple in Pakistan whose uh, medication is running out and you want to get home, you know, listening to Dominic Raab's not going to tell them whether they're going to get home or not. Or if you're a backpacker in Australia who was out on a work visa and the work has dried up and you're trying to get home and you can't and you're running out of money, you know, Dominic Raab didn't help then. And I'm afraid at that point you have to start saying that. You know, so you do both. So, so in, a in a time of crisis like this, I think it is right that we try and work with the government and for the sake of the country, get them to be you know, a decent government and feed in our ideas and our information. But if they won't listen, and quite often they don't, because they're arrogant, then we have to say so. And then we have to call it out, which is what I've been doing. And I will continue to do. And that I think is how you hold them, you know, how I'm holding them to account in my brief. I know that that's what John Mack has been doing. 
um, and you know various other members of the shadow cabinet have been holding the government to account on that basis you know look this is what this is what our experience is this is what we think you should do we give them an opportunity if they don't take it then we have to start criticizing publicly and making it clear why it is that we're pub we're criticizing and 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 what the positive alternative is Brilliant. And the most popular question at the moment is from your colleague, Wes Streeting. So, Wes, let me bring you in. Hello. So I'm just doing my cooking. Uh, hi, Emily. Hello, Wes. And thank you for all the stuff you've been doing to get our constituents home. It's really appreciated. Um, my question was on the power play between the US and China and where you think the UK should position itself within it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that we have a long history of friendship with America. And uh, frankly, we have, you know, we have a long, we have a, we have a long history. Culturally, we're very close. Um, and uh, politically and economically, we're very close. You know, they're our friends. And they always have been. We're not friends necessarily with Donald Trump. But we're, but you know, there. But we're friends with the American people, and I think that it's quite likely that we will always remain so. We'll see how it goes. So I think our natural inclination will be to be an ally of uh, of America. But when you have an American president who just seems to want to square up to people in order to be able to show what a big man he is and to be able to boost his ratings and behaves in the sort of irrational way that he does and uh, arrogant and reckless way that he does. We need to call that out. Um, I think this century will be China's century. I think, you know, I'm not the first to say that. And, um, and we need to make sure that we, that we work as closely and as well as we can with the Chinese, but the, you know, we won't always see eye to eye. But, you know, listen, I mean, it, nobody would have thought kind of, you know, when I went to Copenhagen for the Copenhagen COP, you know, China was getting in the way of an international agreement on climate change. Now, actually, China is one of the leaders when it comes to getting the world together to address climate change. Nobody would have thought that China could change in the way that it has. Nobody would have thought that China would have such um, an important influence internationally in all kinds of developing countries 20 years ago. So I think you know, not only is this likely to be China's century, but I don't think that we can necessarily predict what China is going to be like and how much China might change over those years. But in essence, Wes, I think that we're more likely to be allies of, of, uh, of America than we will be with China. Let me ask uh, Tony Halmus to come in next. Hello, Emily. Hello, Tony. Um, I wondered if you could uh, give us your thoughts on what's been happening in Hungary this week. Uh, the the uh, actions of the Orban Hungarian government to in, uh, uh, introduce indefinite emergency laws, including particularly tough restrictions on free comment on, on by the media or others, uh, which the government regards as hostile, and uh, uh, the suspension of, of all elections. And, and in particular, whether you think the EU has reacted uh, sufficiently uh, and robustly enough, or whether they'd be rather weak about it so far. Yeah, yeah. I think, Tony, we know, don't we, that, that uh, what has been happening in that country has been, it's been a slow, long slide. And it's not as though there haven't been warning signs with some of the things that have been happening historically. Um, and I suspect that they're using the cover of everyone being preoccupied with coronavirus to introduce legislation that they, Viktor Orban has wanted to introduce for some time. I don't think that he's somebody who has democratic instincts and it is extremely worrying what's going on. And the question must be, do, under such a regime, under such laws, with such a government, are they, do they abide by the principles that are supposed to be upheld by members of the European Union? I suspect not. Um, and so therefore the question is going to be, you know, should they be able to remain members of the European Union? I mean, what does it mean? I mean, they, it isn't just supposed to be an economic union. There are supposed, there's supposed to be a meeting of minds politically and in terms of, of general principles. And I think that personally, 
I think that they have stepped over the line. But that's my view. Emily, I'm going to ask one more foreign policy question for the moment and then move back to domestic matters. Um, I want to bring uh, Arak Zeshan. Can you speak? Yeah, hiya. Can you hear me? Hiya. Hi, Emily. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. My question, um, at the start of your speech, you mentioned Rohingya and Yemen, which yes. are important but recent issues. But what about the Kashmir issue that has been going on for the last seven years, uh, seven centuries, sorry. And also at Labour Party conference, there was a motion passed. But a couple of months after, just before the general election, the party chair wrote out a letter against that motion. So what are your thoughts and opinions regarding that? So... Thank you very much for asking that and and I know that Kashmir is an issue that is that is really important to a very large number of Labour Party members and there's a lot of people within the party who campaign on it quite rightly because and and and, and not least because there's a number of people who's you know who are Kashmiri origin and and who you know hear from their friends and their family in Kashmir all sorts of terrible stories about what is going on and it's as if nothing is nothing is being done about it and it seems to get worse and worse i think that in the end i think that the issue of kashmir needs to be one which is resolved by india and pakistan but i think that it's one that they will only resolve if they're prepared to use some political capital and they'll only be prepared to use political capital when both countries at the same time are feeling sufficiently strong that they can expend a bit of political capital. What I'm saying is that there needs to be a compromise, which means that people need to lose a bit of face. And then we need to be able to find a solution for Kashmir. We need to listen to the people of Kashmir, that that is the only way forward. And I think that our role as Britain, as a, as a post-colonial power, is a difficult one. But I think that you know, our goodwill and our, and our um, willingness to be able to assist in terms of holding the ring is a genuine one. I think that there has been in the past work done on softening the border between India and Pakistan um, in the same way that there was in Ireland. You know, so softening the border so that there were things that were being done in common, there were water projects that were being done in common, there, was, there were buses, there were trains going across the border, but unfortunately, you know, they were attacked and there was terrorist outrages and then they got stopped, which is, you know, very unfortunate. Uh, but there needs to be a solution. They cannot just carry on like this. We cannot have two nuclear states facing off one another over the issue of Kashmir. And it is simply profoundly unfair on generations of Kashmiri people who only in the end want the same thing as we do, which is for their children to do better than they do, for them to be able to live in peace and harmony and to be able to develop their businesses in this extraordinarily beautiful part of the world. You know, I've not been there, but my brother who lives with me talks to me about Kashmir and his time in Kashmir and how it was, it, the, the, the beauty of the place would take his breath away, you know, and it's so unfortunate that the, that the future of Kashmir is blighted by not being able to find a political solution. And the, I think the goodwill of the British government ought to be a clear one, which is we will do all that we can, but we cannot step in and impose a, a solution, to, you know, much as, as, as many people would like to, but it is something that needs to be, to, to be resolved by the Indians and the, and, the, and the Pakistanis working together. You know, the Indians need to be confident in terms of their security, and there has to be, you know, we have to acknowledge that they have security concerns, but I think that the Indians also need to, to recognize that you know, when people across the world say they're concerned about the human rights of Kashmiri people, the solution is not to say there is no problem. The solution is to allow international human rights monitors into Kashmir. And if there aren't any human rights abuses, then there won't be a problem, will there? But I suspect that there are. And I think that it's very important for the, for the international community to know and to properly recognize how, you know, exactly what the situation is. But we need to have some independent human rights monitors going into Kashmir and reporting back to the world. So it seems to me we need to make sure that there are facts that everyone can agree to. But the most important fact is, has, are, are the human rights of the Kashmiri people being undermined by what's going on at the moment? 
as I promised, I'm going to return to uh, British politics for a, a couple of questions. I want to bring in um, Christopher Burr. Are you there, Christopher? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can, Christopher. Hello. Uh, hi, Emily. Um, my question really begins by taking you back to that hustings that you didn't attend in Glasgow. Uh, had things gone differently in February and you had been at that hustings, therefore as a potential party leader, what would have been your message to the members of Scottish Labour? I, I uh, am a, a, a resident of, 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 in a Scottish constituency and I mean, frankly, Scotland is a country where there is, to a degree that m most English people don't understand, a very considerable social democratic consensus. It's just that the SNP has stolen it from Labour. And I don't see how the Labour Party is going to get it back or e even avoid extinction unless it is seen to be not ruling out the possibility of independence for Scotland within the EU uh, and, that, and showing that in that context it's a better social democratic party than the SNP. What's your view? What would you say about all this? So the first thing I would say is that as an English leader of the Labour Party it would not be for me to tell the Scottish Labour Party what its policy ought to be on this issue and that I would need to listen to the Scottish Labour Party. We can't be a party of devolution um, and then not be prepared to do it ourselves in our, in our own way of making policy. But what I have heard so far from listening to the Scottish Labour Party is that you know, it has always been our policy that we will do um, as a party what the Scottish people want. They will have the form of government that they want. And the Scottish people have said that they want to be part of the United Kingdom um, with, a, with a devolved power to, to Scotland, um, but they want to be part of the United Kingdom. And we had a once in a lifetime referendum, um, which, you know, which, which, was, which is supposed to have resolved the issue, was supposed to not happen again. I mean, I know, Christopher, that a lot has happened since then and no one can pretend that a lot hasn't. And so what I've been hearing from Scottish Labour is that they are not saying never. They're just not, they're just saying, but for heaven's sake, not this year, which of course is what the Nats want. The Nats want to bump us into a referendum this year, or they were trying to, you know, immediately after a general election, immediately after leaving the European Union, when, you know, when nobody knew kind of what the effect of either of those th two things were going to be on the UK, let alone on, on Scotland. I mean, when we leave the European Union, how far away from the European Union are we going to be? It doesn't seem to me that we can possibly know that until, the, until, until we've been through the interim period and until we've got the eventual agreement. I mean, if we're a long way away from the European Union, then we'll need to have really high walls built, won't we? Between, between England and Scotland, if Scotland's going to be part of the European Union. But if we are actually very close to the European Union politically and economically, then it'll be a different type of relationship. Until that sort of thing is sorted out, I really don't think that it is appropriate for, or, it would, or at all practical or pragmatic, to try and have a referendum, you know, because we don't even know what our continuing relationship is going to be. So I think that the Nats are just trying to take advantage of the situation and are trying to bounce, you know, a, Scot a Scotland which is in grief about having a Tory government, as we are, of course, but, um, you know, having a Tory government and, 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 you know, and shaken by the fact that we're leaving the European Union. But I don't think we should allow them to take advantage of that situation. I think that we need to have this play out a bit. And then let's see how the Scottish people are feeling after that, but not this year, and certainly not that the elections to the Scottish Parliament are in some way a dry run when it comes to a referendum afterwards. I think, you know, suggesting that or if lot, there are lots of Scottish nationalist um, MPs um, elected to the Scottish Parliament that somehow or other that's a, a green light to having another referendum is a mistake. I think the elections for the Scottish Parliament ought to be about why the, why the children's hospital outside Edinburgh hasn't been opened, why they're failing as badly as they are when it comes to um, uh, to, to drug and alcohol addiction, 
you know why they're not able to to deal with an issue like that why they're de why they're failing so badly when it comes to to benefits why it is that scottish children are actually behind english children at school i mean scottish children scottish children used to always be way ahead of us but why it is that their education standards are, are slipping that's what a scottish uh, parliamentary election ought to be about and I think that for far too long we've let the Scottish nationalists hide behind constitutional issues and not challenge them on the bread and butter which is you know they're in power they've been in power for a very long time worse and they have a large amount of devolution it is not all going to be miraculously fixed by Scotland becoming independent where they have complete autonomy such as education and you know, and and uh, you know, and health, and a number of other issues, and they're failing. They need to be held to account for that. And I know that that's what Scottish Labour wants to do, and I would support them completely in doing that. I don't think that we need to keep again and again playing out the should Scotland go independent, should Scotland not go in independent argument again and again. There has to be a time when the Scottish nationalists are actually held to account for doing the job which they've been elected to do, which is to be in charge of a devolved Scotland. Emily, thanks for that. Um, I want to bring in the most popular question at the moment, which is from Tom Hunter. Tom, can you speak? Hello. Hello, Hello Tom. Hello, Emily. Thanks for taking the question. Um, um, so uh, I had a f I'd put a few questions. Oh, in. Sorry, Tom. It's it's the uh, your most popular question is about politicians. Uh, yes, <laughs> male politicians in particular. I think it was. Um, so the questions. Yeah, uh, it's a bit of a loaded question. Uh, so <laughs> why do you think it is that so many unqualified and incompetent men are able to make their way into and hold on to positions of great political power? Yeah, amazing. I mean, let's take it to America, right? So if you had two candidates standing for president and one of them was incredibly experienced and had, job, and had done, you know, the most senior jobs possible and in fact has been, had been married to an American president and had been a senator and this, that and the other on the one hand. And then you had somebody else standing whose uh, who's very shtick was, I have no experience. I I'm going to shake the tree. I'm going to take things in a different direction. Imagine if the inexperienced one had been a woman and the experienced one had been a man. Who would have won in those circumstances? There's no chance that a woman could go into it, can go into an election on that basis. Um, but, you know, I mean, listen, I think most women listening to this will know that the, uh, the best way to fight sexism in our system, no matter what walk of life we're in, the way to beat it is to be better than the men. And uh, we're working on that. Great, Emily. Um, I want to bring in, I'm gonna bring in a couple of questions to finish together, which are both uh, Corona crisis related. So um, I'm just playing with the computer. Uh, Katrina Munro, first of all. Um, Katrina, do uh, you have your question? It's on mute. Hello, Katrina. Hi, Emily. Um, so I'm concerned about the longer term human rights consequences as a result of the current restrictions um, that have been imposed because of the coronavirus. I've heard it said that that's not really Boris Johnson's natural instinct, and so presumably he'll return to letting, letting us go about our business after the crisis passes. But is that a safe assumption? I'm very concerned about that. Let well, me also the, bring in, sorry, I mean, I'm just trying to scoop up a few. No, go, go, go. Um, yeah. Josh Murray as well had a Corona related question. Josh, uh, can you speak now? Uh, yes, hello. Um, Hi, Josh. Sorry. Um, I, yeah, my question was about this idea that's been muted about having a kind of national government um, and how do you think the new Labour leader should kind of uh, fit into that? Okay. And then the final question is from uh, John Nichols. Sorry about this. I'm trying to scoop everyone up. No, no, go. Uh, hello. Um, you've mentioned uh, climate change was mentioned briefly obviously um you know real top issue for the government before the coronavirus crisis started but how how might that might the coronavirus uh, crisis affect uh, efforts on on climate and how do we make the case to make sure that it's not sort of it doesn't fall down down the agenda as countries maybe want to focus more just purely on um 
you know, restarting their, their economies, particularly as the UK is due to host COP. Yeah. So yeah. If you want to wrap up with all those. Okay. Impressive... I will. I'll, um, I'll talk about the human rights implications to begin with. Um, I mean, we before agreeing to the legislation, we did, first of all, we said that we wanted to, to have a review every six months. I and mean, clearly the human rights implications of the current legislation are enormous. To, to, we have not since the Second World War, but this is a crisis and it needs to happen. Um, but we've, um, we do have a six monthly review and it is consistent with the Human Rights Act, you know, which is that you know, if there are an extremist, then human rights can be temporarily suspended, but not permanently suspended. And the Human Rights Act will still pertain. So the, the crisis will need to continue in order to be able to have our human rights curtailed, but there does need to be good reason for doing so. There is good reason at the moment, um, but as time goes on, then it will be challenged if the government oversteps the mark. And I can assure you that's exactly what we will be doing, no matter what we will. Um, as for a government of national unity, well, I mean, I know that that's, it was, I mean, it was appropriate at a time of war when we wanted to make it clear to Hitler that we were not divided, that we were all working together. We were fighting an individual and it was important to show a united front. But I hope that what I've shown by the way that I've been approaching my brief, which is, yes, you do do opposition in a different way during a crisis like this and you have to be responsible. But part of your responsibility is not just that you, that on the one hand, you don't make party political points for the sake of it and nitpick, of course not, but you do need to hold them to account in terms of, you, know, you make the suggestions, you try and help them. And if they don't do what you think they should be doing, you need to call it out. And, and you know, if they won't listen, then you need, to, you need to make it clear that they're wrong and not be afraid. And yes, you'll get criticized. And yes, you'll be told, you know, oh, we shouldn't be criticizing. We should all be working together. Well, we're trying to work together, but if they won't listen, then we need to say so. Um, and as for, uh climate change yes i mean you're right um the worry is of course that uh, that will that the any proposals will be derailed by cop and i uh, by uh, by coronavirus i don't even know i thought that cop in fact had been postponed hadn't it um if it hasn't been postponed yet i'm sure it will be um and what we need to do of course is uh, is not allow that to fall off the table i mean at the moment it will but um, as soon as we get back on our feet again, we have to make sure that it is, again, the first priority. And it comes back to internationalism, doesn't it? And it comes back to the fact that, that we're one world. And maybe it will help to remind people that if something like a, a disease like this can sweep around the world really quickly, you know, and we can, and it shows the importance of us working together, you know, there's an even bigger crisis coming, which is the tipping our world into such as into such circumstances that we'll never recover, and we will never be able to look our children in the face by what it is that we've done, and that we missed the opportunity to be able to fight climate change by simply being preoccupied with Brexit or Corona or whatever the other excuses are. In the end, this is the most important thing for us to do: is to Emily, thanks so much for that. Uh, a sombre note to finish on, but uh, incredibly pressing. And thanks, Emily, for spending uh, an hour with us and to everyone else who's participated as well. Um, we've got lots more Fabian Society online meetings coming up. Uh, watch out for the Fabian emails on our website with more details of those. If you're not a member of Fabian Society, we'd be delighted if you'd join. And if you are, would you consider giving uh, some more to the society through a regular donation? I hope you've enjoyed this evening and we'll see you again at an online meeting very soon. Thanks. <laughs>